I Looks good. It. OK, great. great. Well, well, thank you, everybody, for having me. Um, uh, this is uh, I, I I'm, I'm John Mignona. I run the heart failure program here at Swedish. Um, our main focus is. We do we do all comes all forms of, of heart failure, so all the way from um, cardiogenic shock. We're the leaders for doing ECMO in the Pacific Northwest. We're the only gold center in the Pacific Northwest for doing ECMO. And cardiogenic shock is one of our passions. We see the most cardiogenic shock cases in the region, about 800 a year. Uh, and we have a shock team that responds to every single one of them. And since we implemented that program, we've cut the deaths from shock in half. And so just remember, usually cardiogenic shock, it's a 50% in hospital mortality. Uh, and we've been able to get it down to about 23%. Um, we put a uh, person on ECMO just, uh, just recently. Uh, for for his shock, um, the uh, all the way to we do genetic cardiomyopathies. I I have an, a very comprehensive amyloid program, which we're capturing a lot of amyloid, uh, and we're the lead um, we're the lead prescriber of the most recently updated amyloid medication in the region as well. So it's it was if I had stayed in the university, that was going to be my my vocation was amyloidosis, which is something I did basic science research in along my pathway. But, you know, the last few years, heart failure has become heart failure is basically the oncology world of, of cardiology. And that's why I got into this field. I came to UW from Duke to be an oncologist and then developed a passion for heart failure, which was where critical care and 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 oncology meet. And the reason being that 25% of people over the age of 40 will have heart failure in their lifetime. That was a paper published about a month and a half ago with the most recent uh, epidemiological studies showing that um, heart failure is becoming increasingly uh, evident in our populations. And 50% of those people once diagnosed will die from their heart failure within five years of diagnosis. Um, Correct medication administration can reduce the risk of dying from heart failure by about greater than 70%. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. That's really more for the systolics than the diastolics, which there's still not much medication choices for. Um, however, unfortunately, only 2% of people are prescribed the correct medication regimen. And so towards the end, I'm going to talk about a... a program that I've been working with um, with a company that will use our electronic medical record to try to identify people and identify correct medical medication regimens. Uh, so uh, it's a really good opportunity for artificial intelligence in healthcare. So, you know, I gave I give heart failure talks a lot, as you would expect, and I always like to start with the basics and kind of work my way towards more comprehensive vision uh, thoughts about it. But normal heart. So, you know, this is a nice image that I got from the MRI guys here. So when you look at a heart and so you here, you can see the in one image, both the blood returning back to the heart going through the system. So here you can see it go out to the lungs, return back and then the heart pumping it up and out through the aorta. OK. And the reason I like this image is because it's always hard to kind of communicate a stroke volume. And here, when you see this bright red and yellow, that's the stroke volume shooting through the, the, the system. And so a normal heart will make about 50 to 100 milliliters of blood with each heartbeat. It does it 60 to 90 beats per minute. So that comes out to about three to nine liters per minute of blood. Um, of course, Blood moves from high, or fluid in general, moves from high pressure to low pressure um, and has to push against resistance. So everything about this system is a combination of flow and resistance. And so just yesterday on a patient that we had with carcinoid heart and no right ventricle, but no tricuspid valve at all, all I was talking to the team as they're making taking care of them is pressure and resistance. That's how you keep these people alive in cardiogenic shock. And this system is able to deal with a whole bunch of different physiologies with running and shivering and overheating and stress and sleep and infection and bleeding. 
Um, and so it's a system that while we check our echoes and we're looking at somebody who at, when they're lying on their side, we're asking them to make, make about three liters per minute. It's a system that can ramp up to 20 liters per minute, OK, depending on what people need. And so this is this is work that I when I was in the lab, this is what I was doing. So if you took a heart and you digested it into single cells. Each cell in the heart will contract in the Petri dish. And so you have about two to three billion of these guys, but they are all beautifully electrically synchronized to work to generate the force. OK. Um, so each one of these units are basically those sarcomeres that you hear about. This is what a heart muscle cell looks like. And you see these little compact areas of force generation. And that's what these things look like. It's these, it's these kind of a tug of war. This, it's, this is the rope in between these two sides. And then they have a swing arm that pulls this together and then relaxes You know, every single heartbeat. That's what's happening here. And so we have right now about 82 genes that have been known to be involved in this process that we offer free genetic testing for to assess where, if they have a genetic mutation, is, is causing this. Um, but that's what your heart is doing with each heartbeat uh, throughout your entire lifetime. And so it's generating pressure as it moves the blood through the system. Um, and so as it returns back from the body, it comes back into the right atrium and that you can see the pressure changes. It goes to the right ventricle, to the pulmonary arteries, to the left atrium, then the left ventricle, and then out to your body. And so I always explain this to my patients. It's kind of like that old Erie Canal song that we all learned when we were kids. This is the, the, the canal system to kind of get it up to the next pressures. Um, and so heart failure is a problem where these pressures get dysregulated. They start to go higher and it causes a congestion. It causes a backing up in the system. Um, and then, of course, as the blood leaves the heart, it goes out to the body at this high pressure, but then it goes to the arterial branches and then to the arterioles and then it gets to the capillaries where it has a certain amount of pressure in and then the pressure out. Um, I don't know, can you see my arrow as it moves around the screen or is that not visible? We can see it. You can see it, great, okay. So pressure in and pressure out is a big part of how organs get perfused. And so there's a lot of growing information in, in this world. We focus so much on keeping this pressure up and we, don't focus enough on how important it is to keep this pressure down, OK? But and I'll talk about that a little bit uh, later. Um, when the blood leaves the, the heart, it goes off to all the organs. It goes about 14 percent of the blood goes to the brain, 27 percent to the liver and digestive tract, 20 percent to the kidneys, 20 percent to the skeletal muscle and then and then everywhere else. Um, and so. Basically, with the heart failure, there's really a loss of this function. You get a loss of this ability to kind of generate these stroke volumes. And, and then in order to compensate, the resistances and everything changes. And this is actually, interestingly, this is the same patient. The only thing about it is that it's in reverse. We met him with a heart that looked like this. And then after getting him on the right medical therapy, went back to looking like this. But you can see... The heart, this is the left ventricle, not nearly squeezing as well as one is normal. Um, and so basically what you see with heart failure, it all starts with an increase of left ventricle and diastolic filling pressure. So it, the resting pressure goes up. And that's regardless of whether you are systolic or diastolic heart failure. It is the common problem with both forms of heart failure. Um, so that pressure starts to rise. It leads to higher pressure in the capillaries of the of the lungs. And you get the pleural effusions that you would see on the chest X-ray and fluid starts to build up in the lungs. 
it then builds up on the venous side. And of course, those are the, it builds up pressure throughout the entire body. And just to go back to this image, what happens there is that now we have elevated venous pressure. And this is what happens to that slope of perfusion through those organs. Okay. And this is something I think the field should and will start to focus on more as we go forward. And that's why it's so important to decongest these patients. And, and what I say to patients, even if your kidneys don't like it, we have to get you dry. You have to get your venous pressures down. Because if you don't, your organs do not get perfused. And th there's enough data to show that. Um, so basically, as that venous pressure starts to build up, we see all the myriad of symptoms. We see the swelling in the legs, and here you can see the pitting edema. You see the neck veins starting to pop up and remain elevated. You see the liver enlargement on a lot of patients, and their INR becomes dysregulated. They're, they're, um, they're, they're become, they develop coagulopathies. Their kidneys become engorged, uh, and, their, and their renal function starts to, to fall off. And they, they just become short of breath. Um, you see people having difficulty walking up uh, flights of stairs or, or, um, uh, or and this is, these are the patients that you hear about them coming in uh, saying that they're sleeping in lazy boy chairs or sleeping leaning over the kitchen table. Um, and then this is a major problem is the cardiac cachexia. And, and we see a fair amount of this. The, the literature would suggest that at the time of diagnosis with heart failure, anywhere from 8 to 42% of patients will have cardiac cachexia. Uh, we did a review in Swedish, and about 34% of our patients are at least malnourished at the time of their diagnosis. Um, and so it is a big problem. They, their guts are so swollen that they they have no appetite and they stop eating. Um, so the I'm, I'm going to put in here a lot of the what you'll see in red is updates in that there's a new guidelines that came out this year. So the 2022 guidelines focus more on evidence of elevated filling pressures, left atrial enlargement, E to E prime, pulmonary hypertension, elevated BNP, doing diastolic stress tests, right heart cast, and exercise right heart cast. But everything about heart failure, it's a clinical diagnosis. It is all looking for elevated filling pressures. So it all comes back to the good old fashioned Framingham criteria. Heart failure is a clinical diagnosis. It is not an echo report. It is PND, orthopnea, elevated JVD, pulmonary rails, third heart sound, cardiomegaly on chest X-ray. We get into a lot of problems with that, where people come in short of breath, coughing, and they they get diagnosed with antibiotics a couple of times, and then finally uh, there's a realization that this is heart failure, and you go back to the original chest X-ray and you see that the heart has been enlarged the entire time. Um, so these are the, the, the physical exam findings that diagnose heart failure. I always mention that I had one patient, EF was 18%, never, and it was all discovered on a well visit check. It was discovered because the patient had a left bundle branch block, got an echo, the EF was 18%, and she had literally just finished the Camino, the 400 mile hike uh, across Northern Spain. Um, it is that she does not have a diagnosis of heart failure. She has a cardiomyopathy. It's the patients with these findings that have heart failure. Um, the big push in the recent guidelines is to start to break down heart failure into the three classes. So it is the heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So the EF of less than 40%, which is where we have a lot of the data for how to manage patients. There is the heart failure with mid-range ejection fraction, the EF of 41 to 49%, which we're beginning to get some data on how to treat, but it's it's not perfect. And then there's the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. 
um, which is the, the ejection fractions greater than 50%. So these are the people that diastolic dysfunction patients. We used to refer to anybody with an EF over 40% as diastolic heart failure, but this is becoming more of its own classification. So now heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is very much an EF greater than 50% population. And this is a slide that I've always liked about looking at systolic and diastolic heart failure. It's a little bit difficult to appreciate, but they both show this is your L left ventricle and diastolic pressure. Remember, both systolic and diastolic heart failure have a problem that the LV and diastolic pressure is elevated. It happens in systolic heart failure because it's all been shifted over to where the heart is absolutely stretched out. However, in diastolic, it's just that the heart gets stiffer. And I'll tell you that we have tried over 15 different trials of different medications and yet to find one that has been a home run for treatment of this disorder. Um, Epidemiology, I feel like, you know, you've all probably heard this many times. Heart failure is a major problem. Um, uh, huge expense. A lot of people get admitted across the country with it. It's, it's the most common reason for non-elective admissions in the Medicare population. Um, almost all of the expense is hospitalization, which is why Medicare has made these 30-day readmits and 30-day mortality rules, and they're working on making heart failure a bundled payment metric in the next year. Um, the, the issue we have though, is that of heart failure patients over 65 years of age, the annual likelihood of admission is 35%. If five comorbid conditions, it's a likelihood of 72% admission. So they are a very sick population. Um, they have the usual problems, coronary disease, obesity, diabetes, but the major risk factor for, for, for heart failure is age. The older you get, the more likely people will have it. And this is what you can see, that as we get older, men seem to kind of have it at earlier ages, but then women catch up in the, in the older age. And of course, this is very relevant because we have the baby boomer population in, in, in effect. So, the number of people over the age of 65. And so this is from the Washington State Census Bureau. So this is when they looked at how many people each year were being added to the numbers of age over 65. And then we can see how much during these past few years that, that population has grown. Um, and so heart failure in the Puget Sound region it's expected to increase by 62% in the next 10 years. Um, and I said that pa patients that have many comorbidities will get readmitted more. And unfortunately, heart failure patients have about 40% of patients will have greater than five comorbidities. It's a very common to have many issues. Um, and so it's a, it's a, it's a sick population. Um, this was a paper again published earlier this year, but with the baby boomer population, the phenotype is shifting. In patients over 65 years of age, 55% of them will be HEFPEF, 25% will be the mid range, and only 20% will have the reduced ejection fraction. And so sadly, this is the population that we actually have medical therapies for, this 20% with the reduced EF. The remaining group, it is unclear exactly how to manage this population. Um, so heart, just some last few epidemiology slides. 13% um, of all deaths in 2018 were heart failure. This is heart failure compared to other cancers. So uh, only four cancers were the worst prognosis. And then this is a slide showing the type of heart failure break, broken down by men versus women. So men with heart failure tend to shift to a lower ejection fraction, whereas women tend to shift to a higher ejection fraction. So men tend to be a little bit more systolic heart failure and women tend to be a little bit more diastolic heart failure, but it seems to be kind of somewhat spread out among the two. 
Um, I'll skip through these. Swedish, I, the, the statement is, is that heart failure is the most common diagnosis in hospital patients 65 years and older. We did a review at Swedish, and depending on which hospital we look at, it is anywhere from about 8% uh, of all the patients in the hospital to about 28% of all patients in the hospital. Um, and then mortality, I spent a lot of time working with palliative care. I, I, the, the WHO has put out a position statement saying that after oncology, cardiology is the biggest opportunity for palliative care. And uh, it is definitely an underappreciated opportunity. So I do a lot of educating our physicians that if your patient has heart failure, only four cancers are worse, and they absolutely should at least have a palliative care discussion, either with a palliative care expert or with their primary care physician. But these patients should, especially if they've been admitted to the hospital, they should have a discussion about their goals of care. Um, and then admission is the biggest sign of survival. So if you get admitted to the hospital and you're younger than 65 years of age, there's a 15% chance you will die in a year. If you're 65 to 85 years old, it's about a 30% chance you'll die in a year. And over 85, it's a 50-50 chance of dying in a year. And if it's a second admission, third admission, fourth admission, those are what the prognosis prognoses look like. So while in, they are in the hospital, that is a perfect time to have a goals of care discussion. Um, and I'll just skip through this because we have a lot of slides. We just did a big comprehensive review of mortalities at Swedish. So, you know, we have a, a one of the better than national average uh, for readmissions for, at Swedish for, for heart failure. But we have about the national average from, for 30 day mortality. And when I looked at who died at Swedish within 30 days of mortality, um, this is our population breakdown by age. So the bulk of our patients are 80 plus years old. Um, and you can see the different strata based on age. So this is where our patient population is of, of, of highest risk mortalities is these you know, 80 to 100 year old population. Um, the issue we had when we looked into it is that of the people who died, 95% had a hospitalization in the year prior, and 57% had greater than one hospitalization. 15% of the, or 16% of the patients had four or greater, or four or more greater, oh God, my mom would kill me if I got this wrong, um, uh, hospitalizations, uh, four or more hospitalizations in the prior year alone, 15.8%. And when I've looked at these, it's not common for them to have had a palliative care review. And so I think in the world of heart failure, this is one of our very biggest opportunities. Um, so now just to quickly go through medical therapy, um, I've given these slides a few years ago, uh, but I'm gonna give you the updates. Medical therapy and heart failure almost entirely talks about the low ejection fraction population, okay? These are medications that were proven in the consensus trial back in 1987 with the ACE inhibitors, beta blockers proven in 1995, aldosterone inhibitors proven in 1999, LVADs proven in 2001, ICDs in 2002, CRTs in 2004. And then there was this big gap in what to do. Structural heart hit big um, in 2009. A lot of that work being introduced by Mark Riesman when he was here at Swedish, uh, who is now at, uh, at, at Cornell in New York. Um, uh, and, and Tresto hit in 2014. We participated in that trial. Uh, Evabradine, which has some equivocal data, I will tell you. And then now the biggest thing, and to much of everybody's surprise, are the SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, and then there's some data on drugs like Verisiquat, Omicant of Meckerbill, stem cell therapy, which I did at least 10 years of basic science research in, and iron replacement therapies. Um, so 
I'm not going to really spend a lot of time on it. Just that ACE inhibitors are a class one recommendation. Uh, you know, everybody knows that. Everybody with an EF less than 40% should be on at least an ACE or an ARB or an ARNI, which is the Entresto. Everybody should be on a beta blocker. And just to kind of again state, there are only three approved beta blockers. It is either carvedilol or bisoprolol or metoprolol succinate. And it has to be the succinate, not the tartrate. Comet trial clearly proved that tartrate does not have a survival benefit. Um, so it's carvedilol, bisoprolol, or metoprolol succinate are the only acceptable beta blockers. And the goal is usually a heart rate in the 60s, if in sinus rhythm. And then there are the aldosterone inhibitors, so spironolactone or plerinone, class one recommendation. Um, if the patient is black and already on the other three medications that were just stated, talked about, um, hydralazine and isosorbide give a further survival benefit on top of that therapy. Um, the um, Sorry, and then ICD and CRT, basically the way we see ICDs, if the ejection fraction remains less than 35% and you expect the patient to live more than a year, ICD therapy is, is appropriate. CRT therapy is for anybody with a left bundle branch block and a QRS duration of greater than 150. And of the things that we do, CRT, if somebody has that problem, a left bundle branch block and a QRS of greater than 150, 60% of patients will significantly improve. So it's one of the therapies that has a pretty strong benefit. And Tresto, so and Tresto came out in 2014. It had a absolute risk reduction of death of 2.8 compared to enalapril. And when you looked at heart failure death or hospitalization, it's about almost a 5% absolute risk reduction. Um, so Entresto is now considered to be superior to ACE inhibitor or an ARB, and it is recommended that people are switched from an ACE or an ARB to this drug if they're not back to NYHA class 1 symptoms. Um, now, the biggest update since I last spoke to the OMC group is the SGLT2 inhibitors. This was a big surprise about two years ago. And I always tell people anecdotally, the story is, is that whenever a new class of medications for treating diabetes comes out, those medications have to be tested for their cardiovascular outcomes because people with, heart, uh, with diabetes tend to have heart disease. The original, the initial trial was meant to just show that these drugs don't kill people with heart, fa with, with heart failure. And to their surprise, it actually showed that people had fewer hospitalizations and better survival. So then they embarked on doing two trials, looking at answering exactly that question. And again, they showed these patients had better survival and fewer hospitalizations. Then they did two more trials looking at non-diabetics. And in the non-diabetics, they saw patients that, and I'm showing that here in the non -dive. they showed that people had fewer hospitalizations and better survival. So now we have four clinical trials, all showing fewer hospitalizations and better survival. And there is no medication in the current world in, in cardiovascular care that has four random controlled trials proving a survival benefit. So. That is one of the most strongly studied medications right now in management of heart failure. When asked what's the mechanism in the heart, I mean, you know, it, it, SGLT2 inhibitors block the receptors, the, the aquaporins in the, in the kidneys, but the exact mechanism of how it helps the heart is still unclear. Um, what I like about this drug is that it also has a mild diuresis and when Given this drug and Entresto, I'm often able to get people off their Lasix. So it's a it's a it's a good medication. I give it for both my systolic, but for both my diabetic and non-diabetic heart failure 
patients. OK. Um, medical therapy reduces the risk of heart failure by greater than 50%. This is a slide that I will draw out for my patients when they, I see them in clinic. This is what a survival tends to look like for heart failure patients. They tend to be diagnosed when they're feeling quite poorly. Usually with the right medical therapy will get them feeling better and that will last for an, an indeterminate amount of time. However, this heart problem will sooner or later manifest into a larger problem, and they will have blips in the road of hospitalizations, escalation of diuretics, needing more, uh, needing decreasing in medication because they cannot tolerate as much. And when patients are in that phase of being rehospitalized, or needing diuretics, or they are just clinically unstable, that is where the advanced heart failure clinics tend to should be seeing these patients. And we do a lot of work with stabilization and trying to optimize and see if we can move them back to an earlier stage or get them set up for hospice or you know advanced you know, care or get them set up for transplants or LVADs. And so transplants uh very successfully done uh, across the country lvad uh is a procedure that we do here at swedish we have greater than 90 percent one year survival with lvads um, and what that is it's an artificial heart pump that gets placed at the tip of the heart it sucks the blood out and ejects it to the rest of the body um the transplant in the current age has a 50% 12-year survival. LVADs in the current age have a 50% 7-year survival. Um, and so we're often doing LVADs in people that are not transplant candidates uh, for a myriad of reasons. Either they are too, too old or over 70 years of age, or they still are actively smoking or actively using marijuana or actively, or, or their BMI is greater than 35 or their A1C is greater than 7.5. Those tend to be the reasons why somebody would not be a transplant candidate. Um, this is a curve showing survival of patients who meet the indication for LVAD who do not receive it. So it's about uh, less, fewer than 10% of patients alive at two years, whereas uh, it's about 80% alive at two years um, and this is the old, I'm sorry, I have a newer slide. This is 80% alive at two years if receiving the HeartMate 2. If receiving the HeartMate 3, it's almost 90% alive at two years. Um, HEFPEF, so heart failure with preserved ejection fraction has been the bane of the heart failure world's existence for a long time. Um, I, it, is, uh, it is still a, a medical disorder that wasn't really believed to be existent until about 20 years ago. Uh, and so it is a stiffness of the heart as people get older. I often tell people that the problem with this heart disease is that the kidneys will continue to struggle as we try to keep people euvolemic. And they will often end up on some renal replacement therapy in the future. The medical therapy that we have proven showed benefit in systolic heart failure have no benefit in diastolic dysfunction. So ACE inhibitors, aldosterone inhibitors, uh, uh, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, digoxin, uh, beta blockers, no benefit in, in diastolic heart failure. Um, the sildenafil, no benefit. Aldosterone inhibitors is still kind of equivocal, but the TopCat trial failed. Uh, nitrates failed. The only thing right now that seems to show a benefit in diastolic dysfunction is exercise, is weight loss and exercise. So I keep looking forward to the day that we do a semaglutide trial in 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 uh, in diastolic dysfunction. But um, I there nobody's ever done yet a bariatrics trial or a semaglutide trial in diastolic dysfunction, but a significant exercise regimen 
will improve diastolic dysfunction. Um, the problem with diastolic dysfunction is that it's a, it's a many different disorders in, in one. And Tresto has been studied now in three trials. Swedish has been the only center to be participated in all three of these in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and I will tell you, as somebody who was the PI on all three of these trials, even though the FDA has approved this medication, it is a very, very mild benefit uh, for a drug that is not cheap. Um, and so it is difficult to get people on this medication. I don't really push them to get on it because again, the benefits are very, very mild, as you can see here. Um, there's no significance in the two trials that looked at it. And the, the benefit that was seen was more in the patients with an EF of less than 57%. In, in these trials, the qualification was an EF greater than 40. And so remember, there's the new criteria has the mid-range ejection fraction. So that's where I tend to believe more of the benefit of the nepolysin inhibitors. The um, SGLT2 inhibitors in HFPEF have gotten a lot of, of, of uh, press time. Again, the FDA has approved it. Um, I participate on a lot of committees for this, and a lot of physicians really are pushing to get every patient on uh, with HFPEF on an SGLT2 inhibitor. And again, I, I always kind of have to talk to the physicians because as a person who prescribes a lot of these medications and has to deal with the insurance companies, these are again an expensive medication with an indeterminate benefit. So in the HFPEF population, remember these are the EF greater than 40%. Um, they had a death from cardiovascular cause was not significant. Death from uh, hospitalization from heart failure was not significant. So it was only if you put the two together would you get a significance. It was a 3.3% absolute risk reduction. However, again, when you looked at the patient population, it mostly benefited the mid-range ejection fraction patients. It mostly benefited those 40 to 50 percenters and the over 60%, it didn't, it didn't seem to have a benefit for um, the 50 to 60s maybe had a benefit. So it is a little bit equivocal about whether to put people on Jardians or Farsiga with HFPEF, especially with the better ejection fractions. So, Basically, the guidelines are on this on this topic are control the blood pressure, and the current guidelines are less than 130 over 80. Diuretics are class one indications. Revascularize them. You know, look for you know if these patients tend to be short of breath, so look for coronary disease. Treat their AFib. I try to keep people out of AFib if I can. Beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, ARBs uh, are, were at then a 2A recommendation. They've actually now become more of a 2B recommendation. Um, and so basically right now, hypertension should be controlled. SGLT2s are 2A. Um, AFib control is a 2A. Spironolactone or plerinone is a 2B. Uh, an ARB is a 2B, uh, and uh, Entresto is a 2B. So not, not any real emphatic recommendations for HEPPEP, unfortunately, at this time. So I know that both neprilysin inhibitors and SGLT2 inhibitors have been approved by the FDA, and I would certainly suggest that if you have a diabetic patient who has HEPPEP as well, you, you should put them on an SGLT2 inhibitor. But otherwise, due to the cost, it is it is I, I tell patients, you know, if we can get it for not a lot of money, I'm happy to prescribe it. But if you're paying three hundred dollars a month for this drug, I'm, I'm not sure that that's where money is well spent. I would rather they spent it on a personal trainer. Um, so 
that's the heft pad. That's all the medical therapy. I'm I'm now going to kind of get on a little bit of a soapbox about what I've been focusing on a lot now. Um, my main focuses at Swedish have been our cardiogenic shock programs um, and all of our mechanical heart pumps, which I think we do an excellent job for. We are really doing a lot of work in ECMO. We we put the first person in the United States on ECMO for COVID. And until then, not one ECMO patient, all the data we had was from China. They never, they reported that nobody survived ECMO. Our first patient was a physician who came down with COVID, uh, survived ECMO, was out of the hospital within 11 days. So so that was one of our, our most exciting uh, updates in the last uh, three years. But, um, but the other thing that I focus heavily on is getting patients on the right medical therapy. It is a big problem still in America. We have all this data showing that if you get people on the right therapy, you will save lives. If you get them at the right doses of these medications, you will save lives. The problems we have though, Two are twofold. One is patients don't take their medications. This is a very sobering view. Of the 100 prescriptions written, 50 to 70% are filled at the pharmacy, 48 to 66% are picked up at the pharmacy, 20 to 30, 25 to 30% are taken properly, and 5 to 20% are refilled. So that's one major problem with medications. The other problem is that patients are just not getting prescribed the right treatments. So of the people who should be on an ACE or an ARB or an ARNI, only 20% 20, uh, 20 are not. Of the people who should be on a beta blocker, 14% are not. Of the people who should be on spironolactone or plerinone, 64% are not. African-Americans who should be on hydrology and the nitrates, 93% are not. People who should have resynchronization therapy, 61% do not. ICD, 49% are not. And so, like I said, I spend a lot of my time getting patients onto LVADs or ECMO. I, we, I, we have partnered with Spokane and we do heart transplants. We do a lot of work in that world. Um, and when I've done the numbers of this, we save about 10,000 lives a year with all of that fancy mechanical support equipment heart transplants, LVADs, all that business. Whereas if we just got them on the right therapy, we would save in the order of 68,000 lives a year. And so just as a brief exercise, I, I pose this to my group of, of the medications you know to treat heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, which one has the best number needed to treat at 36 months? and to arrange it in order. The number one is spironolactone and a plerino, which again, 64% of people who should be on this one are not. Number two is CRT. Number three is beta blocker. Number four is the SGLT2. Five is an ICD. Six is an ACE or an ARB. And seven is an ARNI over an ACE or an ARB. So I'm not saying that any one of these are more important. What I'm saying is that all of these are important. And the ones that we see being prescribed the most are the beta blocker and the ACE ARP. We need people to get on all these treatments. This is a computer program that I've been working on with, with, a, with a company nationally. We've been looking into the electronic medical record on trying to find all the patients that are on the right medical therapies. And it will spew out, it works on Epic and is able to detect how many patients are on the right medications or are not. And it comes up with the data on just on the survival, their outcomes, and it can give us the actual MRN of each patient so that we can go back. The plan with this program is that we would then designate a few nurse practitioners and pharmacists to identifying these patients and moving the signal on getting them on the right therapy. Um, 
in in this review, which we had, we don't have any Swedish hospitals or province hospitals in the review. We have six hospitals from the East Coast in this review that are currently using the program. And what you see is that of patients who are not on any medication, almost 40% are dead within one year. Um, the So we've been working on trying to move that needle, okay? The furthermore, if you get them on the right medications, their readmission rate will go down. It is actually now considered a class one recommendation in the most recent guidelines that performance measures based on professionally developed clinical practice guidelines should be used with the goal of improving quality of care for patients with heart failure. And now my little soapbox thing, because we have a major problem in healthcare, as you all probably know. But we are going to be asked to do more with the same or fewer resources. There will be 10 to 15% fewer cardiologists in the next decade. We see it in our own practice. When I first joined the group, over 30% of our physicians were over the age of, of 60 years old. And this is true of healthcare in general. So the number of Americans greater than 65 years old will double from 47.8 million in 2015 to 98.2 in 2060. So 24% of the population. 45% of cardiologists were over 56 years of age and 20% were over 60. At the current rate of graduation, 700 graduating cardiologists each year, it's projected to replace only 50% of the retiring pool. And this was a paper that came out before the great retirement phase of COVID, when a lot more people who could retire decided to retire. Um, we are also coupled with a problem that <clears throat> the information doubling time is incredibly fast. In the 1950s, it took 50 years for the information to double. In 1980, seven years, 2010, 3.5 years, and in 2020, it's 73 days. I will tell you right now, I knew better who to put an aspirin on 10 years ago than I know right now. Now we have a new paper, about one paper, three papers a year, I'm sorry, telling us who should be on an aspirin and who shouldn't based on this DOAC or this valve morphology, this AFib, whether they're a woman or a man, it changes constantly. And this is a perfect opportunity for artificial intelligence to come in and assist us with this. So that has been a major focus of mine. Um, I hope to be um, bringing out this uh, program to our system pretty soon and seeing if we can we can improve our healthcare uh, without expanding our resources. So that's one of our most more exciting things that I've been working on. But that is my presentation. That's the update for heart failure. Um, and so I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that anybody might have. Thanks so much, John. Uh, great presentation. And uh, do uh, others want to uh, ask a question? Hi, uh, this is uh, Gretchen. I'm a nurse, but I'm wondering what's the likelihood of Providence getting involved with the testing of the artificial intelligence program? Oh. That looks so promising and exciting. It's, it's a great question. Um, we're, we're working on it, I will say. I mean, the, the there's a lot of issues with this and that um, you have to be, obviously, we have to be incredibly careful with, uh, you know, patients, electronic medical records. Um, and uh and, and going anywhere outside the system so that we're working on a system where they the the information would remain blinded to any outside but we would still be able to come to the actual patient names but we're, we're been, i've been working on this since uh it's a great question because I, i've been working on getting it out since uh, uh november of last year so we're we're, we're working on that Thank you. Uh, question mark uh, from Bill Kintner. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that uh, use of marijuana was a uh, 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 disqualifier yeah. for transplantation. Is there some direct effect of marijuana on uh, yeah, cardiac function or failure? 
<laughs> it's a great question. When I was at the UW still, I was asked to kind of write up our guidelines on social recreational things. And and I tried to remove it. I said, you know, it's a it's a legal drug. I don't understand why we would uh, why we would not. But it is still mandated. Both the UW and Spokane mandate that people have to be six months free of any marijuana use. And and to your point, uh, it's a, I always feel like it's important for patients to know the actual reason. And the, the rationale is that in the um, bone marrow transplant literature in the immunosuppressed patients, use of inhaled recreational marijuana uh, was associated with significant aspergillosis of the lungs. And in patients who are immunocompromised, um, you can't treat that. That that is a, a, a no, no amount of of antifungal will will treat that. And so, I've always kind of argued that's a bit of a stretch from telling people they can't beforehand use marijuana for you know it's a bit of a stretch to say. So yeah, that's that's the rationale. That's why they can't that the the data and the heart and the transplant literature. There's no data on um, orally taking up marijuana causing similar problems. Um, I just think it's just something that if the lab can detect it, they don't want it. Um, uh, but again, I, I never understood why it would be six months of being free from using marijuana before being listed. It happened to me uh, about four months ago, we had a local school teacher who had sudden cardiac arrest, was found to have ARVC. Um, marijuana was positive in the blood tox and, and the transplant centers wouldn't take him because he needed six months free of marijuana use. Um, and uh, luckily, we were able to recover, recover the young man uh, and is still doing well, but that's still the rule. John, I want to sort of back into this question a little bit. Um, some people on the call know for many, many years I've been a nut about how messed up the problem list is in EPIC for most institutions. Uh, and it's uh, in many cases uh, uh, just sort of obscene uh, um, uh, and it really shouldn't be. Um, I've wondered about the role for AI uh, in, in helping to create uh, a better uh, centralized problem list that would benefit all of us. So where I'm going with this is with your AI heart failure project, uh, could you reflect a little bit on te how you tease out or coalesce in your project the realities of the several serious comorbidities that go along with heart failure to ultimately make successful treatment of heart failure better, whether or not it's human or AI? It's a, it's a great question. I, it's something, it's funny you bring it up because I've, I've given lectures on this too. Um, no matter how important people think problem lists are, they, they sat, like, they're very important. Um, and that um, it, the, so, one of my issues with what the medical record has become is that the medical record has become a billing platform, you know, and it's not been totally used as a healthcare platform. Um, but Medicare and everybody else has now used it as a way to judge our performance platform, right? And so, and the problem list is a big part of that is when they decide, are you doing a good job? They look at what's in your problem list and how sick is your patient and are you addressing the comorbidities and everything else? And so if you get the problem list in that, one of the biggest things we did to improve our O to E for mortality and readmission rates at Swedish was we cleaned up our documentation. Like our docs didn't realize how important their documentation was. And the way CMS was seeing it was that we were killing these very low risk heart failure patients. Um, 
And when we taught everybody the importance of documentation of their comorbidities, all of a sudden, everything that we get judged by is the observed, which is, you know, what happened versus how expected it was, how many medical problems the patient had. And I always gave a lecture about a patient who died. And when you looked at what the billing was of how sick that patient was, it was a patient who was like uh, in somewhere in the 70s, came in with heart failure, you know, and, and died uh, five days later. And when you looked at the actual case, and I don't know how this didn't get documented, but the patient had came in with a rectus sheath hemorrhage he had was in rapid atrial flutter, you know, morbidly obese. Like when you looked at the comorbidities, it just went on and on and on and on. And none of that was being documented. Um, so documentation is so vital to determine the observed to expected ratios of everything. Problem lists are so vital because it's just a fast way that anybody, there's so many hands now treating a patient that nobody has the time to dig through all the notes and the nuances to go through it. So everybody, the, the problem list is the fast way that we can get right to the heart of the matter, know what the comorbidities are. And then with AI in the future, because again, we are gonna have fewer healthcare providers. So we are gonna need our healthcare providers to really focus on what the nuances are of medicine rather than the basic thing. And AI should be able to go in and find, you know, the diabetic patients, the A1C, they need to be on this, this, and this, they need their foot to be checked here, they need this to be done here, you know, heart failure reduced EF, they need this, this, and this, and this. There's no way, I, I know a lot of physicians get nervous about informatics replacing us. There's no way that's going to happen. With our population booming the way it is, we need to rely on AI to clean up the more simple things so that we can then focus on the more complex medical care that you know we're all trained to do. So, you know, this is something 